It's been over 70 years since the outbreak of the Pacific War. Soon, there will be no one still alive with personal experience of that war. Kesazo Oka survived the fierce battles of the New Guinea campaign. It took him more than three decades after the war to come to terms with his grief for his fallen comrades. You're the first person I talked to about this. Up to now, never complained much. After all, I came back home alive. But I'm, today I'm telling you, It was sheer hell. For me, it stopped at the gates of hell, so that was for the best. But was it? After our defeat, there was a lot going on. I thought of this as a punishment. I survived. I came home. My punishment. Starting in 1944, the Allies engaged Japan in a series of fierce battles for the islands of the Pacific. An enormous number of soldiers lost their lives. Civilians, too. One tragedy after another. Over a span of four years, NHK recorded the personal accounts of more than 800 people who experienced that war. Now facing their twilight years, these survivors spoke of grave matters that raise issues for all of us. Yoshi Nihei underwent harsh experiences on the islands of the Pacific. Three months after being filmed for this project, he passed away at the age of 84. With the Americans closing in, he and his whole family resolved to commit group suicide. He felt he had no choice but to take up his gun. He was 18 years old. All right. I sit my mom down. She puts her hands together. Thank you for all the years. She's praying. Okay, let's go. I aim at her heart and pull the trigger. Bam. And my mom, the blood just spurting out. Then my dad says, here, do it here. So that's my second shot. And she slumps. My kid sister is watching this beside me, Kimie. She's nine years old, acting like it's her turn next. She sits down with our dead mother and puts her own hands together. I take aim. Wait, big brother. So what on earth? I want a drink of water. So I give her a couple of capfuls of water from the canteen. Here, drink. She gulps it all down. It's delicious. Delicious, big brother. That's plenty. Now shoot, I'll join mother. During the first third of the Showa period, over three million Japanese lost their lives in wars. 
Over 80% of those deaths occurred as the Pacific War was coming to an end in 1944 and 45. What was going on in that final year or so? Survivors are providing a spoken record of despair on the battlefield. Nakaji Motoyama was born in Nagano. He was stationed on the South Pacific island of New Guinea from 1942 until the end of the war. He had 62 men under his command. The battlefield was unforgiving. It was said no one would return home alive. Somebody said that he was going to commit suicide, but he'd rather get someone to kill him than... set off a grenade himself. I didn't want to pull the trigger myself, so I asked a subordinate officer to do it. He didn't want to do it either, nor did the squad leader. So I did it. Yeah, the war was that bad. Mm -hmm. If my parents had heard about this, Of all the Pacific battlegrounds, the one where the fighting lasted the longest, three and a half years, was New Guinea. The Japanese army committed 200,000 men to this theater. 180,000 lost their lives. In the summer of 1944, the Japanese army in New Guinea responded to an intensified Allied offensive by attempting one final decisive battle. But after such a long campaign, the soldiers were debilitated. The Japanese army suffered a huge defeat. Those soldiers who survived the fighting were cut off in the dense jungle. As Japan's position throughout the Pacific deteriorated, Imperial headquarters stopped sending reinforcements and supplies. Now, the troops were attacked by severe hunger and illness. Kenshiro Yoshizawa, 29 years old at the time, had left behind a new bride in Japan. We were eating plant roots. We'd eat tree leaves. We'd eat palm fronds down by the beach where the palms grew. Moonlight would be glancing off the palm fronds, all glittery and shiny. Uh... In Japan, my wife must also be looking at the moon. I want to view it with her. That kind of talk is pure selfishness, but I did think if I can save myself at least, we're beyond hope here. There's nothing left to eat, but I'll get back somehow. So I'm walking through the jungle, and there's this guy sitting slumped on a huge tree stump. I thought he was dead, but he was still breathing, crawling with maggots. They're spilling out of his mouth, his eyes. Any place there's an opening, they're seething. 
So I thought he was dead, but he was alive. Hmm. That's that. Yeah. Nothing to be done. He was calling out, help me, help me, but no way could I help when I could barely walk myself. The forsaken battlefront of New Guinea. The situation was so dire, Japanese soldiers even stole food from each other. Isamitsu Kobayashi was a member of the military police charged with enforcing discipline when chaos reigned. One soldier was washing his mess tin and near him was a can about this big. And inside that can was some um, salt, just a bit of salt. Two other soldiers saw that. They wanted to steal the salt. They lobbed a grenade at him. When we reached this point, we were hearing frequent reports of cannibalism. So, headquarters ordered that no soldier should go anywhere alone. If you're alone, then bang, you might be done for. Right when this company was eating lunch one day, my regiment passed by and there was this clattering as the guys who were eating banged their mess tin lid shut. Later, I heard that somebody had told the MPs that such and such a company had been eating some of their own. A regimental bulletin was issued, so we didn't hear it directly, but apparently it said that anyone consuming human flesh would be strictly punished, except when the flesh was that of hostiles. So if it was an enemy, you could eat him. That's how desperate we were for food. Despite suffering from malaria, Keisazo Oka directed operations for crossing New Guinea. But his troops, too weak to fight, prepared to meet their end in the dense jungle. It was an atrocity, a massacre. Really, the upper echelon, back at Imperial Headquarters, or the 14th Corps, or the 17th Corps, those higher-ups, I'm bitter about them. Sure, they mostly killed themselves after they got back to Japan, the top commanders. I see here they committed suicide. So, it's not like I have any right to speak so proudly. <laughs> but you're going to the trouble of talking with me, so I take this attitude. It's really kind of painful, you know, to talk about it. It's painful. I mean, if the dead could hear me, they must think me pretty stuck up. Some Japanese villages lost many young men in the Pacific theater, such as Fujine in northeastern Japan. 111 men, some 90% of the total lost, died in 1944 and 45. Misao Fujieta's husband was one who died on the front in New Guinea. The military informed her merely that he had died of illness. <laughs> Wanting to know more about her husband's demise, she looked up his surviving comrades. 
people did eat human flesh. That's what they told me. And those people who ate anything, see a snake, eat a snake, see a frog, eat a frog, those people survived. They made it through. But your husband, they said, he simply didn't do that. He would only eat jungle plants. Misao has an unforgettable memory involving her husband. The harvested rice, it's bundled into sheaves and put up on stakes. A mouse got in among them and I was chasing it. And he said, stop, don't kill it. He was that kind of person. Don't kill it. He just had feelings like that. He was truly a gentle man. <laughs> Fujine, a single village, sent 608 young men to the wars of the Showa period. And during those wars, one man played a remarkable role back in the village. Wherever the young men were sent, Asia, the Pacific, they wrote letters back home via military post, almost 7,000 letters. Almost all of them were addressed to a particular village leader. Minijiro Takahashi, a veteran of the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 5. He then spent nearly 30 years mentoring the village children as an elementary school teacher. At the village academy, it was he who took charge of military drills. His drill style earned him the nickname General Gung Ho, behind his back. But among the many cohorts of youth that he trained, his devotees were numerous. Minijiro sent a bulletin containing village news to his former pupils at the front. Shinyu, the true friend. Minijiro put special effort into visiting families and reporting on their circumstances. Kisaku Obara household. A dog was barking, and the mother and the wife went out to look. They finished the rice planting on June 14th. Kanojo Takahashi household. The mother was spotted on the porch sewing. Her grandchild played nearby. By informing the soldiers fighting abroad that village life was tranquil, Minijiro hoped to allow them to do their jobs without any anxiety about the home front. We waited so impatiently for that true friend, even if it was just a single line. And when I say a single line, I mean just a word or two. Everybody would let out a loud cheer when they read news about their own homes. The traditional demon sword dance of Fujine. It's a Shinto ritual to pacify the souls of heroes who have met untimely deaths. In wartime, services were held at this same shrine to pray for good fortune for those who were being sent to the front. Minijiro Takahashi often attended these services. He said the following to one of his former pupils. One does not slay the enemy for the sake of killing, but for the sake of peace in the Orient, the Japanese sword cannot remain sheathed.
He also sought to fortify the resolution of the villagers in prosecuting the war. War means sending many troops to battle and consuming vast amounts of ordnance and ammunition. Make bullets. Make money to make bullets. Women's associations on the home front. Has your ardor cooled? The village's casualties continued to mount in the autumn of 1944. At the home of a different Takahashi, Kie Takahashi prepared for her husband's second deployment. Matsuji was his name. He was 27 years old. To this day, Kie retains feelings of deep regret. This concerns a comment she blurted out in response to her husband's hesitancy in going off once more to war. When my elder brothers went off on their second or third deployments, they were strong. What is it with you? Be strong. I was trying to encourage him. My big brothers went off on their second or third deployments. They didn't cry. Don't you have any guts? I actually said that. <laughs> Five months later, Matsuji was slain in battle on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Really and truly, we waged a stupid war. <laughs> Minijiro tried to whip up sentiment in favor of the war among the villagers. However, in the letters his former people sent back through the military mails, the harsh conditions on the front lines were starkly noted. All we have is coconuts. Today again, bombs were raining down on us. This soldier died in combat in New Guinea in January 1944. To Minijiro, a beloved teacher, a soldier might reveal even his deeper desperation. Recently, I think I'm losing my mind or something. I don't know if I'm tired of war or if it's because I've lost so many of my buddies. Actually, my nerves are so shot, I don't want to write anything at all. I don't even know what I'm writing. New Guinea, the forgotten battlefield. Under assault by Allied forces, the Japanese troops were being forced ever further into the hinterland. In the spring of 1945, an astonishing incident occurred. A detachment of troops suddenly vanished. A messenger was sent out. There was something to be transmitted. And at some hamlet somewhere, he found a campfire that was still warm. But nobody was around. So where did they all go? He looked everywhere. Nobody.
the whole detachment had surrendered en masse to the enemy. For the Japanese army, this was an unthinkable event. It is forbidden to incur the disgrace of being captured alive. The detachment had violated the army's strictly observed field service code. The bold step of surrendering had been taken by Lieutenant Colonel Masaharu Takenaga. He was commanding troops who had barely survived an all-out bonsai charge. The 42 surviving Japanese POWs were interrogated by the Allies. Lieutenant Colonel Takenaga revealed that about 80 of the 120 men under his command had died from starvation or disease. If they had not surrendered, he said, they would all have died. Masao Horie was a staff officer at the headquarters of the 18th Army, which controlled operations in the New Guinea campaign. To this day, he remains uncomfortable with Takenaga's action. I think he was a compassionate person. Or maybe I should say his emotions got the better of him. His men suffering, he simply couldn't bear that. Not his own suffering. I don't want to think the problem was he couldn't bear his own suffering. No, no. Everybody wants to live. And to escape suffering. But as an officer, you're placed in that sort of environment, entrusted with a mission. And if you're given a mission, then at times you have to purge yourself of those emotions. You have to live by a code. That's my take on it. Many of the POWs themselves would rather have died. Allied interrogation reports note the soldiers thought they would, in fact, be killed by the enemy. They did not want to be repatriated to Japan. One of the veterans who obeyed Takenaga's order to surrender agreed to be interviewed anonymously. He says that after the war, he never met with any of his former comrades in arms. In early spring, I would get letters requesting me to attend ceremonies for consoling the spirits of the deceased. I never went to a single one of them. Of course, we wound up losing the war. There's that disgrace. And you've lost comrades. You feel guilty towards them. Everybody goes off to the South Pacific and their corpses are left all over the place for their bones to bleach right where they fell. And in my group, I'm the only one who makes it back alive. Well, that's lucky for me for sure, but I also feel guilty about those other guys. So, I don't want to dredge up memories of New Guinea. Why did we ever go to such a place anyway?
as huge numbers of soldiers were abandoned on the Pacific Islands, the destruction of war came ever closer to the Japanese homeland. In April of 1945, half a million American troops landed on Okinawa. Non-combatant civilians were caught up in the fighting. 94,000 residents lost their lives. Until then, Okinawan life had been tranquil. Chieko Namisato lived on the island of Iejima in Okinawa Prefecture. She survived horrible experiences, including a group suicide conducted in darkness and the deaths of family members. In my heart it feels there's something hard, like a stone. I really feel pain. This feeling, it's always been like this for me. When I remember the past, the pain becomes unbearable even now. But, um... War. American forces landed on Iejima two weeks after launching their invasion of Okinawa Island proper. 1,000 of Iejima's 3,000 inhabitants were mobilized for the fight. Not just adult males, either. Youths aged 14 to 16 were organized into a youth volunteer corps. Even the girls were ordered to serve in a relief squad providing nursing care to the sick and wounded. The islanders did not begrudge their cooperation to the military. In Okinawa during the war, patriotism was drilled into young hearts and minds at school. The goal was to produce Okinawans who, despite having their own culture, were conscious of their status as Japanese nationals. We thought Japan was a first-class nation. We were Japanese nationals. We had to do it. That's what we were taught. That's what we all thought back then. That's all we could do, we thought. That's how we all felt then. Before the Americans landed, the Japanese army issued a communique to Okinawa Prefecture. Let the army, the government, and the people be as one, a shared life, a shared death. So the Japanese army and the Okinawan people were to live together and die together. The Americans' target on Iejima was the Japanese military airfield. After they landed, it took them only three days to occupy more than half the island. In retreat, the Japanese army ordered the Youth Volunteer Corps to commence an assault. The island's youth were sent out on suicide missions, clutching hand grenades and death charges. 
The idea was to knock out tanks. We'd sneak up to them, you know, crawling. Oh, we weren't thinking about anything, really, other than get it done quick. We were prepared to die. When we went out, we were prepared to die. The girls in the relief squads not only had to nurse the wounded soldiers, they were also assigned the dangerous task of transporting ammunition to the front lines. Shige Oshiro was driven into a shelter deep in the island's interior, along with Japanese army soldiers and volunteer corps members. There, they decided to attempt an all-out assault on the American forces. But Shige had a baby sister, so the two of them were left behind in the shelter. Shige will never forget seeing the young women of the relief squad departing on that final charge. They traipsed off so lively as if they were going out for some entertainment. They were holding hands. You didn't see any tearful faces. It was all, see you soon, do great deeds, but they didn't come back. Not one. Even though they knew they were being sacrificed, still, that's how people back then behaved. For many years after the war, Chieko Namisato would not discuss her own memories of Iejima. She was nine years old at war's end. She and her mother and others would huddle, petrified, as their bomb shelter reverberated with the sounds of artillery shells. Cradled in her mother's arms, her six-month-old younger brother would suddenly burst out crying. It got on everyone's nerves, right? A child crying. So the residents were saying, deal with that kid. The soldiers, of course, were especially on edge. There was one who wouldn't shoot the baby. But next to him was this volunteer corps type. How old would that person have been? I'm thinking about maybe 20. He told him, you shoot it. The situation was so tense in that atmosphere. It's really beyond expressing in speech or even in writing. And under those circumstances, my mother killed the baby. Her mother pressed the baby's face to her bosom so hard that he could not breathe. Chieko says that after the war, her mother brooded greatly over the past and that when she was on the verge of dying herself, she called out the name of her dead son. Ninety families on Iejima were destroyed in their entirety. Altogether, some 1,500 inhabitants were sacrificed. The Japanese had been involved in wars that started in China in 1937, then spread over a vast area in Asia and the Pacific. Fujine had supported all these wars from start to finish. Every summer, people gather at a local Buddhist temple to pray for the souls of the war dead.
This bell was constructed after the war with funds from Minijiro Takahashi, who had sent so many of his former pupils off to fight. It seems Minijiro rang the bell every morning, telling the villagers of Fujine, when you hear this bell, think of it as the voices of the war dead. The voices of the war dead. Hmm. That was the notion. Inscribed on the bell are the names of the 130 villagers who died in the war. Among those names is that of a young man Minijiro particularly cared about, Katsumi Takahashi, member of a kamikaze unit. In April of 1945, he perished in an attack on the American fleet off Okinawa. He was 26 years old. Starting with his first round of military service in the war in China, Katsumi had written Minijiro 44 letters. In them, he repeatedly reaffirms his warlike resolve. Minijiro responded with encouraging words. Immediately prior to his suicide mission, Katsumi wrote a final letter to Minijiro, stating that he was prepared to die. He wrote, I, Katsumi, am going to go out with a bang. That was to Mr. Minejiro. He meant his plane would score a direct hit, and he'd go, boom, boom. Before he passed away in 1967 at age 84, Minijiro Takahashi rang that bell every day and prayed for the souls of the war dead. This goddess of mercy, made with earth taken from a battlefield abroad, was sent to him by his former pupils. During the war, he was so gung-ho, a real booster. Afterwards, he felt guilty about those who never came back. Minijito was seen making the rounds of the bereaved families, his head held low. A mistaken national policy was believed in and at times supported fanatically by huge numbers of Japanese. What it brought them was huge numbers of deaths. There are some living through the long post-war period who have been asking themselves some tough questions. This is Takasaburo Monden. When his unit was on the verge of retreating from the battlefield, he was ordered to leave behind a fallen soldier who was wounded but still breathing. Maybe at 
It's my conscience. Whatever I did, he'd still have died, that's a fact. But then there's what I guess you could call my own cowardly act. For that act, I can't forgive myself. I just can't forgive myself. As a company commander, Masuji Sano ordered his men to fight to the death and personally participated in a desperate final charge. He has a notebook containing the names of the men who were under his command. Almost all of them died. Of the 200 men under his command, only four returned home. Ever since the end of the war, there is something Sano has forbidden himself from doing. The old man here just doesn't go out. He doesn't go out anywhere. Sure. I think it was the effect of the war, of course. Even when our kid built a house or opened a clinic, he absolutely refused to go out. He didn't feel like going to hot springs or going sightseeing anywhere. A man who did so much to encourage others to die. He's responsible. How can he go off and play? So, war is one thing we should not do. People do say that, of course. But as times change, other things change, one after another. Three months after recording this account of what war meant for him, Masuji Sano passed away at the age of 87.